Good morning and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. How are you today? Amen. Nice, plus. Isn't it amazing being in the house of God? Amen. Amen. Well, before we start, I just want to say a few things. Uh, my name is Austin Powell. I just graduated from Southwestern Adventist University, and I am so happy to be home. And I don't know about you, have you ever gone on a long vacation? And you're, you're going on a long business and you're on long vacation, and finally you get back home, you get to go and get to sleep in your own bed. You know, and it just feels right. Yeah. Well, I want to say being here this morning, getting to worship with you, getting to, getting to meet you, just feels right. Amen. And I know that God is in this building, that, and he, that he's in your hearts. And I'm excited to see what amazing, awesome plans God has for this church. And with that said, l- let's go dig into the word this morning. But before we dig in the word, let's have a word of prayer. Tell me, Father, Lord, how amazing you are. Lord, this morning, I have a simple request that you hide me behind your cross. Lord, that you hide me behind your word. And Lord, that if I am seen, that I'm only seen as a sinner who is saved by your grace. Lord, we love you, and we can't wait to come back in the clouds. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, I just graduated from Southwestern Amherst University. So to start this morning, I'd like to share with you an experience I had at Southwestern University. You see, if you're going to be a freshman at Southwestern, you have to take a class. And you see, there's this one class that every freshman dreads. And the reason they dread dread it, and this class is called Principles of Active Learning, the reason they dread it isn't because of what is taught, but it's because of when it is taught. You see, this class is taught in the wee early hours of 8 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) And you see, as I started taking this class, I I quickly started to learn that my friends started to dislike me. And you see, they started to dislike me because they started to learn that I'm one of those people. You see, I'm a morning person. (laughs) So for me, 8 o'clock in the morning, that's, that's sleeping in. Amen. <laughs> Some other morning people. But so as we were continuing to take this class, the, t- the teacher or professor, her name was Dr. Gardner. And she's one of the English professors at the university. Amazing lady. And as we were taking a class, she had us read this book. And this book was called Under the Overpass. And so what the book Under the Overpass is about is about two college students, Mike and Sam. And see, Mike and Sam, they have a crazy idea one day. They say, you know what? We want to experience what it would be like to be homeless. So this is what they do. For a span of six months, Mike and Sam go to major cities such as Phoenix, Denver, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and San Diego. And during this time, they sleep in, str- sleep in the streets, in the, in the shelters, under bridges, in parks. And they try to experience what it is like to be homeless. And, at one, and in one count, they're in the city of Washington, D.C. And you see, this was one of the lowest times for them. You see, they're in Washington, D.C., and Mike, he has a guitar. And he's playing his guitar, and he's trying to get some money. But no one's giving him money. And they get so hungry, so desperate, that one night they find themselves rummaging through the trash cans. And Mike, the author of the book, as he was writing, said, this was the lowest point of our experience. And during this experience, we wanted to give up. Because you see, for them, their greatest obstacle was also their greatest hope. Because were Mike and Sam actually truly homeless? No. And see, they knew that. They knew after the span of a time they get to go home, or after the right phone call that they could go home. And as I was reading this book, I started thinking, you know what? You and I, no matter which What happens in this world, no matter which circumstance we find ourselves in, we can never truly be homeless. Amen. So, continue, hear me out. So, let's say the market crashes during potluck this evening. I hope it doesn't. But let's, let's just say that the market crashes and we find ourselves all sleeping under a bridge. That would be one big bridge. But we find ourselves sleeping under one big bridge. And even under those circumstances, we would not be homeless. Because our home is not on this earth. Amen? Amen. But our home is in heaven. Amen. And this morning, I want us to repeat what our scripture reading was for today. I want us to read together 
John 14, 1 and 4, and I want us to repeat this promise that God has given us. And let's read it together. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. No. No. Amen. This is our promise, that this world is not our home. And my sermon today is about the blueprints to our new home. Because like anyone, when you're about to get a new home, you want to see what it looks like, right? So today I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. And in Revelation chapter 21, we find the blueprints to our new home. <clears throat> and as you're turning in your Bibles to Revelation 21, I want to invite you to do as my kindergarten teacher used to invite me to do. I would like to invite you to take out your imagination caps and to put them on. Because I'd like you to imagine what our new home is going to look like. So in Revelation 21, and we're going to start with verse 1. And it says, Then I saw a new heavens and new earth. For the first heavens and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed, for her husband. Now I want to stop here and I have a question for you. Who here is a married man? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm talking to you. I want you to go back in your mind. It might be a few days, it might be a few years, but I want you to go back in your mind to your wedding day. And I want you to relive your wedding day. You're up front by the pastor. Your groomsmen are behind you. And all of a sudden, you hear this, the music start playing. And as the music starts playing, you look down the aisle, and there she is. And I want you to think in your mind, what were the emotions? What was going through your head when you saw your beautiful bride walking towards you? Were your palms maybe sweaty? Was your heart pounding in your chest? Maybe even your knees were kind of wobbly? And as you were staring at your bride walking down the aisle, did you think, there she is, the one I love. And I'm going to get to be with her for the rest of my life. And I want you to remember this feeling, remember this thought going through your head. Because when we read in, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, we see this is the same experience that God is going to have when he sees the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Because see, when Jesus sees the New Jerusalem coming out of heaven, it is full with the ones he loved the most. It is filled with those who are saved by his blood. But let's keep reading, because we haven't gotten to the blueprint yet. So we're in verse 3. And in verse 3 it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. My friends, when we get to go to the New Jerusalem, when we finally get to go home, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more bills. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and even more, you will never, ever again have to be lonely. Because God himself will be there with you. And even more, he'll wipe away your tears. Amen. This is where I want to be. But let's continue reading. We're in verse 5. And in verse 5, it says, He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. My friends, this is the God we serve. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he is anything and everything you could ever desire or want. 
But we haven't gotten to the first yet, so let's continue reading. So now we find ourselves on verse 7. And on verse 7 it says, He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God, and he will be my what? People. Sons. I don't know about you, but there's nothing more I desire than to be a son of God. But we see here, there's a certain word, and it's, and it's but. So here we see that there are two different classes. And the next one here says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murders, the sexual immorals, those who practice magic arts, the adulterers and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And here we see, just like from the very beginning of the, the earth's history, that there are two groups. There are the sons of God, and there are sons of this world. And as I was reading this, it made me think, you know, from the very beginning, God desired for all of us to be his sons and daughters. Amen? But see, they had to choose not to be God's son. And as I was reading this, it reminded me of a story, and I like to share the story. My grandma, she used to tell me the story when she lived in Waco of a homeless man who he would always be on the same corner of the street. He was kind of like the neighborhood, friendly old homeless guy. Everybody liked him. And see, my grandma would tell me that once a week, she would give so much to this homeless guy. It was kind of her act of giving. So every time you see him, she'd be like, God bless, you know, sometimes pray with him. And she'd always give this friendly homeless guy a certain amount of money. And one day, a few years later, this homeless man passed away. So the city was kind of distraught because they're like, oh man, our homeless guy, you know, he, he passed away and they were wanting to have a funeral for him. So they're like, you know, does he have family? Does he have friends? So they started kind of digging into his life. And as they continued digging into his life, they discovered that this homeless man wasn't homeless, but that this homeless man was a millionaire. And even more than that, he had a family and he had a mansion. But he gave it all away for his love of money. Because you see, this homeless man, even though he was a millionaire, he never wanted to spend his money. <clears throat> and as I think of this story, and as I read this passage, it makes me think, we all are millionaires. Because we have eternal life. But yet, are we willing to give it away for something as simple as money? Because you see, there's a thought going through, there's a thought going that's prominent among a lot of Christians, and it's called universal salvation. It's the belief that no matter what you do, you'll be saved. But here we see that it's a choice, that you have to choose to be with God, and that there can be things in your lives that are keeping you away from God. And it's my prayer that whatever it be, that you give it to God. But let's continue reading, because we haven't gotten to the blueprints yet. So we get back to verse 9. And on verse 9 it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now you still have your imagination caps on, right? Because I want you to imagine the scene. It shone with the glory of God. And his brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had great high walls with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The walls of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Do you see it? How many sides does the New Jerusalem have? Four. Four. And how many gates are on each side? Three. Three. So how many gates in total are there? Twelve. Twelve. Exactly. And you see, as I was preparing for the sermon, I was reading through this, 
It reminded me of an experience I had in Chicago. My family, we were in Chicago, it's about four years ago, and it was in November. And for anybody who's ever been to Chicago, you know that it's gotten the name the Windy City for a good reason. You see, for anybody who hasn't been to Chicago, the wind in Chicago is just like the wind in Texas. This, this, it, does, it just doesn't have the warm hearts of the Texas people to warm it up. So it's super, super cold. So we're all bundled up and we're Texans, so we're not used to this cold. But then the winch is cutting through our coats. So as we're going through, we're trying to explore, be tourists at, at, in Chicago. And as we're going through, we get the crazy idea and we're like, you know what? Let's go on a boat tour. So we go on a boat tour and we're going through and there's a tour guide. And he's pointing out all these different buildings and telling us the story behind it. And he said something that I remember to this day. As we were about to finish our tour, he says, you know what? I want you to know that behind every building, there's a story. So as I begin to read the New Jerusalem, I start to wonder, is there a story behind the New Jerusalem? And as I dug into it, I realized that there was. Because you see, for John, he's the one who saw this. When he saw this city, it had to be really odd. Because you see, back in the days, back in the days of Jesus, the cities only had one gate. Because you see, the purpose of a gate wasn't to let people in, but it was to keep people out. And only if the city was super, super big or super, super powerful would the city have more than one gate. So imagine what, what John must have thought when he saw the New Jerusalem coming down. And it didn't have one, didn't have two, but how many gates does the city have? Twelve. And you see, as we read this, we discover that the gates of the New Jerusalem weren't like the gates John was used to. Because you see, the gates of the New Jerusalem weren't made to keep people out, but they were made to let people in. Amen. And I once heard it said this way, the New Jerusalem is God's last appeal. And he's saying to the people of this earth, if you live in the north, come into my city. If you live in the south, come into my city. If you live in the, the, the west, come into my city. If you live in the east, come into my city. He's telling the whole world, I want you to be with me. But you see, some people still believe that the gates were meant to keep people out. See, there's a, a thought that's going through Christianity nowadays where it believes that you have to work your way to heaven. Like if you feed so many homeless people, it'll get you closer to heaven or something. And I want to share an experience with you because this thought is more prominent than I thought. See, the story I'm going to tell you, it's still a little fresh. See, what I'm about to share with you, the experience, it happened about two months ago. You see, the reason I've been gone from you guys so long is that I finished one class before I could graduate. And this class was called Field School of Evangelism. And during this class, I was in San Antonio for the majority of the summer. And while I was in San Antonio, I was hel helping Pastor Mark Finley with a group of series or with a, oh, with a group of series, and we were Bible workers for him. And during this time, it was so much fun, it was a blessing, but during this time, I want you to know that I saw the great controversy. And before I share my experience with you, I want you to know that God wins, and that he is more powerful than anything else. So one day, my buddy and I we were, we were being Bible workers, and during this time, we had a class in the morning, and then in the evening from 2 to 8, we go visiting people. It was great. So we were visiting people, and one afternoon, we ran out of people to visit. And we we're like, man, what do we do? It's only 5 o'clock. We got nobody else to visit. What, what, what do we do? So we were going through, and we had a list of prayer request cards. So we were going looking through, like, maybe we could do, you know, a cold visit. Maybe we could just stop by and see some of these people. So we are going through, and as we were going through, we saw that this one lady had written two prayer request cards. One of them said, pray for me because I have a stomach ulcer. The other one said, pray for me because there's a darkness in my house. So like any young Bible worker, we're like, hey, we need to go visit her. So we go, we drive over, we find her address, and we, we go over and we knock on her door, we, you know, we come up to the house, we knock on her door, and she opens the door, we tell her who we are, tell her with Mark Finley, and instantly she's excited to see us. And she's like, oh, coming in. And she's about to invite us into her house. 
But then she stopped. And she's like, no, no, let me come out to you. I'm like, okay, we're just happy to see you. So we start to talk to her, you know, we're, we're, we start to ask her, How, how's your stomach? Are you okay? You know, can we pray for you? And she starts talking. And then after we're done praying for her, we, we pull out the second prayer request card. And we're like, you know, we saw this. Could, would you like to talk about it? And she begins to tell us that some supernatural things have been happening at our house. And she said, the reason I went outside was because I was afraid for you guys to come in because I don't want it to know that you are here. So while we're there, we begin to pray with her and begin to talk to her like, you know, God is stronger. And we continue to talk to her, can do quote scripture with her. And finally, we get to the go-to answer as a Bible worker. We're like, you know what? You need to talk to Mark Finley. Because during this whole time, whenever we didn't know the answer, whenever someone came up to us and had us baffled, we're like, you know what? You, you need to talk to Mark Finley. So that night, we introduced her to Mark Finley. And, it, and afterwards, at, later that week, he's like, you know what? We're going to go visit her. So we go into her house and we visit her. And during that time, Mark Finley has a Bible study with her. And he's going through the Bible and showing that God is stronger and showing her promises in the Bible that God is stronger than anything else she could ever face. We pray with her. And finally, before we go, he's like, you know what? I want you to tell me where the things have been happening. So he says, they've been happening in my room. So we go into her room, we kneel around her bed, we quote some promises from Psalms, and then we pray for her. Pray for her in her house. When we finish praying, Mark Finley is getting up and he's promising her, you know, the devil cannot no longer bother you. He's mad, but God is stronger and God is guarding your house. And as he says this, things start to fall off the windowsill. But he totally ignores it and he continues to tell her, God is stronger than anything else you could ever encounter. And so we begin to walk out of the house. And as we begin to walk out of the house, we see in her lawn, about 10 feet away from us, a car in reverse. And you see, the crazy thing about the car in the reverse is, in, is because you see her lawn was up on a little ledge. Because see, there was a curve here, and then about a foot and a half to two feet, there was a concrete ledge. And somehow this car had popped up onto this concrete ledge. But to make this even more crazy, a woman came over and she said, you know what? She's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. My car just turned on by itself and got in reverse and went onto your lawn. But you see, once we saw this, we stopped everything we we're doing and we said, you know what? This is proof that God is stronger and that nothing can bother you anymore. So we stopped and we prayed. But you see, this isn't the story I want to tell you. This, you need to have the pretext for what I'm going to tell you because Maria, after our visit, wanted to give her life to Jesus Christ. So that Friday, she wanted to be baptized on, on Saturday night. So that Friday, myself, my buddy, a local pastor, we come to her house and have a fin like a final study with her, a final Bible study before she's going to be baptized. We even go through, you know, how to be baptized, been with the knees, not with the back. And at the end, we pray with her and we leave. Saturday night, we're at the meetings and we're walking around. No Maria. She's not there. So finally, we go to the local pastor and we're like, hey, where's Maria? And he says, Austin, come here. I need to show you a text. And he shows me his phone. And on the phone, Maria texted him and said, Pastor, I want to be baptized. But at this moment, I feel like there are too many things in my life and that I'm not good enough to give my life to Christ. I want you to know today that it's not about you. It's not about our goodness, but it's about His. Amen. And all we need to do is accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and believe in Him, and we will be saved. Because do you see whose names are on the foundation of the city? They are, they are the apostles of the Lamb. And were they perfect? No. They had anger issues. Peter denied Jesus three times. He cut off a guy's ear. We have this, the sons of thunder, who I don't think they got that name because they were loud for Jesus. <laughs> and then we had Matthew, who he was a tax collector. Because see, we see that it's not about us, but it's about Christ. And we can be confident in one thing, that he who begun a good work in you will continue it 
until that glorious day, until the day when Jesus Christ comes back. But I want to continue reading because we haven't fully gotten the picture of what the new Jerusalem is going to look like. So continue with me. And we're on verse uh, 15. Verse 15, sorry about that. Verse 15, it says, the angel, the angel who had talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12 sedias. 12,000 sedias. What, what is 12,000 sedias? 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles. That's 1,500 miles. So just to help you imagine how big this city is, it's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, but check this out, it's 1,500 miles tall. This is the home that we have in store for us. But there's more. If you look in verse 17, it says, He measured the walls, and they were 144 cubics thick. That's 210 feet thick. These are massive walls. But there's more. Because I want you guys to imagine what our new home is going to look like. In verse, in verse 18 it says, The walls were made of jasper, clear jasper. The city was pure gold, as pure as glass. And the foundation of the cities were decorated in every kind of precious stone. Can you see it? And then it says the first foundation was jasper. See, jasper can be either a clear or a red stone. Next we have <clears throat> sapphire, where sapphire is a translucent sky blue stone. Do you see it? We have clear, we have sky blue, and then we have, and forgive me if I slaughter some of these names, chalcedony. Well, chalcedony is a green gem. So we have clear, we have blue, and then we have green. And the next one, we may be more familiar with this one, it's emerald. And this is a bright, beautiful gem. So we have green, then we have emerald, which is a brighter green. And then the, the fifth we have is sardonyx, where sardonyx is a white stone that has different layers. So it has a brown layer and it has red layers all within it. <clears throat> the next one is sardis, where sardis is a red stone. And then we have chrysolite, where chrysolite literally means a gold stone. Do you see in your mind? We have a clear, we have a blue, we have a green, we have a brighter green, and then we have a white with brown and red in it, and then we have a red layer, and then, and then we have a gold layer. But we're only halfway done. Because next we have, bro, which is a sea green stone. And after that, we have topaz where topaz is a yellow colored stone. And what's interesting is that this, the, this material topaz is the stone that they use to make seals for, when the, for authority. So when the king sealed something, this was the material that they used. And after that, we have chrysoparts, which is an apple green transparent colored gem. Then the last two ones are a light purple and a deep royal purple. So can you see? Let's go over once again. We have a clear layer. Then we have a translucent sky blue. Then we have a greenish. Then we have a bright green layer. Then we have a white layer with brown and red in it. And then we have a red layer. Then we have a gold layer. And then we have a sea green layer. And we're not even done yet, because after that, we have a yellow, we have the yellow layer. And then we have apple green and light purple and dark purple. My friends, our home is going to be beautiful. But let's keep reading. Let's go on to verse 21. Verse 21. It says, <clears throat> The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great streets of the city were of pure gold, like transparent glass. Can you see what our home's going to look like? How beautiful our home's going to be? You see, in preparation to this sermon, I was talking to my buddies two weeks ago, 
And I did what pastors normally do, because when we start reading stuff, we get excited about it. So I started explaining to him what the new Jerusalem was going to look like. And I was like, dude, check this out, check this out, check this out. And he was like, man, man. And he said something to me. He's like, you know, the new Jerusalem, man, it's going to be beautiful. But I'm just afraid that if Jesus doesn't come soon, that there won't be room for me in it. And my friends, I'm going to give you the same answer that I gave him. The biggest problem of the new Jerusalem is not going to be that it's overpopulated, but that it's underpopulated. You see, I did some research and I found out that from the span of Earth's history, there have lived 106.5 billion people. So let's imagine that evangelism works and 106.5 billion people are all saved. Amen? Amen. So all 106.5 billion people are saved. And so if all 106.5 billion people are saved and they're in the New Jerusalem, how much room do you think each, and each of us would have for a home or apartment? Well, I did my research. And if every single person from the span of time on Earth's history was saved, all 106.5 billion people, each one of us would have 2.25 million square feet. What would you do with 2.25 million square feet? You know, I begin to think about this because I, I like just to sit down and think about, you know, heaven, think about the New Jerusalem. And I start to imagine, do I have any gardeners out here? Anybody who loves the garden? Imagine what you could do in your house. You could literally plant a, a rainforest in your house. And then for people that like to swim or go scuba diving, you could have a coral reef in your house. And for me, as I was thinking about it, I, I like basketball. And I was thinking, you know, in my living room, I could have a full court basketball gym. <laughs> and I know we have some people here that play volleyball. You could have not one, not two, but you could have five volleyball courts in your house. But I want, I want to share something with you. Because you see, for me, the reason I want to be at the New Jerusalem isn't because of how beautiful it's going to be. Isn't going to, have, isn't going to be to have a basketball court in my room. But the reason I want to be in the New Jerusalem is that one day I want to walk outside my house and I want to see Jesus. And, but you see, Jesus is passing by my house. And I want to be able to run up to him and look him right in the eye and say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then I just want to hear him say, Austin, my son, let's take a walk. See, this is why I want to go to heaven. Amen. See, this is why we were made to be sons of God. And my friends, this world is not our home. But our home is to be with Jesus. And we were made to be with Jesus. Amen. But you see, the devil knows that. And he wants to do everything in his power to distract you and to discourage you from being with Jesus. So my friends, we have a choice today. Who will we choose? Where will we choose to make our home? Will we, will we make our home in heaven with Jesus or on this earth? Because my friends, just like the homeless millionaire, we could lose it all while having it all. There is nothing on this earth worth losing our salvation. And this morning, before, before our closing hymn, I want to make a simple appeal. And I want to ask you to stand up. But before you stand up, I want you to know why you're standing. This morning, if you want your home to be in heaven, if you want to see Jesus face to face, if you want to say, Lord, there may be things in my life that are keeping me from you, but Lord, I want to give it to you. If this is your desire this morning, 
I invite you to stand with me as we sing face to face. <laughs> 